Hi, team. Uh, welcome to episode three now of the Lions Den podcast. Today we've got Hugh Tizard, Harlequins, and England under 20s second rower with us today. We're going to be chatting all things rugby about Hugh's journey uh, to professional rugby and touching on being in as its mental health awareness week, some tips or some some advice on, on what Hugh does or what they do at the club at, at Harlequins um, in order to, to touch on those things because it's really important to talk about uh, our feelings and how we feel um, through all things mental health awareness. So just to kick things off, Hugh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right, thank you, mate. Yeah, just trying to survive through these uh, these tough times. But I say they're tough for everyone, but just keeping focused on, you know, rugby at hand and then also the bigger picture. So like trying to help out family and stuff like that. But no, it's, it's all right. Spending a bit more time with the family than normal, but haven't started arguing quite yet, so... Oh, cool. What's the typical sort of week looking like at the moment? So, for me, the biggest thing is trying to wake up early every day because I've just get into a bad body clock. So now, I'm, at the moment, that's one of my focuses. But on a Monday, you know, I'm just Monday to Friday, just focusing on that rugby stuff. So whatever it may be on that day, and then um, weekends trying to relax a bit, and then also try and try not to play too much Xbox as well because that's been. Definitely something I've focused <laughs> too much on. What are you Xbox? Uh, uh playing a new war zone on Call of Duty. Oh. So there's a few of us from the ACAD house last year, um, still very close. And we got like a this clan group and some of them have spent silly amounts of money on it, but <laughs> it's all good fun. Is that all like those uh so it's not you, you spend money on fake money, is that is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So you're, Wasting your money for money that isn't real, but no, it's keeping us busy, I suppose. So that's good. Oh, cool. And you say about like the, the rugby side of things through the week. What's it sort of? We had James Lang on a couple of weeks ago, um, and he was talking about you know doing the broken bronco um, and different bronco times and stuff. And it'll be interesting to to find out your times and what you've done as a, as a forward. But we can we can get onto that. Is uh, what what does the rugby side of things look like um, from week to week? So firstly, from like a fitness point of view, I've tried to get up in the morning, do that. And I'm doing probably four, minimum four runs. Sometimes I try to squeeze five in. And then at the moment, just trying to change it up because obviously, you know, eight weeks into this lockdown, you know, stuff gets repetitive. So I'll probably do one continuous run uh, and then two Bronco types of runs, which are always the worst. And then probably like a Tempos run as well. The Broncos one, I tried to do a Tuesday and Friday, so I have Wednesday off from running to try and get myself back after the Bronco. What are your times on there? So what's what's the game for you at the moment? What do you need to be under? Well, second row it is under 5.15, but I think realistically, because I'm quite a young one, they'd like it under 5.05, five minutes. I think last last summer I got 5.03. That was my oh, best. Nice. But I was I was chuffed with that. But um. Yeah, they definitely definitely that is a focus for them, you know. And especially, do you see the Bowden Barrett got four, yeah. four minutes twelve? Actually, ridiculous. After speaking with James, I've been trying to do like the uh, just some broken Broncos, and I did. Um, I've been, only been doing five, and then minute on minute off. But that's like the pace that they're going for the whole minute. So I'm just as long as I finish it in within a minute. Um, yeah, I'm getting minutes rest. But the problem is, I'm getting to about that minute mark, and then I'm. Done. No, I need that yeah. minute to recover again. So the thought of having to do five back to back is just killing me at the moment. Yeah, no, I think that's that's how I, you know, I started it actually. Just doing those like back to back. And then I slowly went 50 seconds, 40 seconds, and then drive. But no, it definitely quite heavy as well. So it's definitely one of my uh my weak <laughs> it's probably not my strongest. And where, where, are you, where you sit within some of the other forwards and the other academy lads? So I'd say the best ball is you got someone like Dino Lamb, who's this absolute freak. He's at 6'6", 125 kilos. He can run for days. He probably gets, I think he got 430. So you got that side of it. And then you got some of the bigger lads, some of the front rowers doing about 425. So probably middle of the pack, I suppose. But no, I think some of the, the ACAD lads, usually we, we, fair, you know, we do fairly well. Um, but... You know, I've got a second row, one of my best mates, a second row in the same year as me. So it's actually quite good because we try and 
keep going with each other. So that's that's good. That definitely makes it a bit quicker. But yeah, no, so we're pretty good. Pretty good. Nice, nice. So I think you've come through the last two guys. So we had James came on the first time and we had Henry Paul on last week uh, on, on the podcast. And they both took quite unconventional routes into um, professional rugby. Whereas I think you've come more through the um, the academy route, as, as it were. Um, but can you tell, start from the beginning, what's, you know, about your rugby journey? Where did it start and, and how did you get there? Yeah, so started at, um, this is a confusing bit, so it's obviously Guildford and Guildfordians, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> started at Guildfordians when I was about six, and you could ask my dad now, and I hated it, and I couldn't stand it. But then as soon as we got to contact, he said I was just you know, the different player that actually loved it. So I was there until I was 14. I then moved to Guildford, and from there I got a trial into the, the Surrey rugby programme. So I think that was like the sorry development at the time. So I did that for two years. And then in under 16 season was all when it sort of took off for me, I'd say. And um, I played in like the the county games against Sussex and Hampshire, I think. And then luckily the Quinns Academy coach, Jim Evans, was watching. So he then called me back a week later to trial with them. And I went through a series of trials. There's a big tournament at Wellington, which is like a residential thing, which was good fun. Um, and then luckily got into the under 18 program. So that's, you know, so the 17 and 18. So you do the Academy League and all that. And, um, but that summer of after GCSEs, um, the Quinns had got in touch with Cranley and vice versa. And my parents had got in touch with Cranley. And I was lucky enough to get a scholarship there. I think it was probably the turning point in my rugby career as such, you know, it was all rugby focused. I'd never had school rugby like that. As you know, I count it was never quite the, <laughs> quite the same. So I was training every day in the gym every day, which was you know, definitely beneficial. And then did all the school seasons, the Academy League stuff. And then luckily would have been Christmas time, 2018, got offered a, my first contract. So yeah, that's definitely my route into the, first thing set up and stuff what was it like going you touched on it briefly there what was it like going from uh county because my first memory of you you know I, i'm fortunate to have played a tiniest little part in in uh in in your rugby and um you know my first memory of you was in the guildford county gym with you louis and tom just doing yeah. Starting drills after no one turned up to the training on a Monday night. Um, so yeah, exactly. How does that differ? Like, what was the, you know, what was it like going from uh, county over to Cranley? Yeah, so for starters, you know, as you said, there not many people at county. It's definitely a football school there. Not anyone, not many people are interested in rugby. But getting there and doing the first couple of days of pre-season, I didn't know anyone. There was about eighty boys going for the first team rugby. It was absolutely nuts. And then. Just the fact that they played rugby for so long, the quality was, you know, it was similar to an Academy League game and stuff like that. And then having coach you know, Andy Houston there as well. He's, yeah, just an awesome coach. And, you know, I've learned the most of a coach off him. And he he just has the, the ability to turn, you know, I came in unfit, not having played much good quality rugby. And then by the end, you know, I'd, I'd like to think, you know, I was up there in the school circuit or what have you. So, yeah, definitely just having that, that leadership and organisation from him and then the competition from other boys as well for places. It was just, yeah, it was a perfect environment to get better in, I'd say. Nice, nice. So you touched on Andy Houston there uh, being uh, uh, the, the coach that you've learnt the most from. Um, what, what else or who else, like family, friends, have helped you, have been pivotal in, in getting you to where you are now? Yeah, I say that the obvious one would be my dad. You know, he loves rugby, he watches every game, even if it's, you know, France Div 2, he'll still watch it and stuff like that. And uh, he definitely, when I was younger, must have spent hours trying to explain to me, you know, the rules, the ins and outs of it. Uh, and then also just simply driving around the country, you know, some some of the games, you know, we played with, you know, together at Guildford, they were miles away and school games and driving down to Bristol to go and play them. So stuff like that, he was like really influential in and then obviously just the rest of the family as well my sisters are all keen like sportswomen and they love doing their netball and hockey nice nice and, and what about um other coaches along the way like your first uh, coaches over or um where you are now um any anybody else 
Yeah, so this coach is at um, Guildford's, you know, and I was very young, probably quite, you know, patient with me. I didn't enjoy it at the start. I complained. I try and get off injured, but I was only playing touch rugby, so I don't know how I got injured there. <laughs> but stuff like that. And then when we got to uh, to Guildford as well, doing that like cup run that we had, just the whole coaching staff, like those boys that didn't know each other and stuff like that. But the fact that we got it like a squad together and, you know, boys from different schools, different backgrounds, what have you. Um, you touched on it briefly, you know, about the, the stuff under, you know, you, you weren't enjoying the game as much before the contact. Um, it, what was it? Was it mainly just to do with not being able to tackle people or what was it? Other things that were in play when you were younger? Yeah. I think my dad's tried to like, try to work it out. You know, it wouldn't have, I can, it was just the fact that I probably got agitated by the fact that I could be running around someone and they could be slower than me. And then they just pull my tag. Something like something as simple as that was probably what triggered it off. And yeah, as soon as I got to contact, yeah, I just loved it every minute. And then I think I probably remember every end of year and primary school. So one, two, three, four and upwards, you'd write like your end of year evaluation, what you want to be when you're older. I can always just remember writing, I want to be a fresher rugby player. That's every year from then on in. Yeah. I was never very good at my writing when I was very young. And I remember my teachers writing me notes saying, even professional rugby players have to be able to read and write. That's cool. Are you still doing, are you still continuing your education now or what's what's happening while you're, while you're at Quinn's? So I was in the academy house last year and I decided to have like a year of education for a few reasons. And you know, definitely distractions was one of them because, you know, six lads living in a house, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But this year, I um, started to do like a read into business studies as a course. I didn't do it for A-level, which I regret, but um, I just thought I'll read into it. So that come this September, hopefully I'll start a course at Open University and do it there. Yeah, I think I'll do it over six years part-time. It seems fairly manageable. And then, yeah, just trying to get a head start at the moment. And especially while we've got all this all this time now, no reason why I can't. Yeah, what's, what's your motivation at the mo- uh, to do that? Is that driven by you or is that something that the club enforce and encourage you to do? Or It's yeah, definitely encouraged by, um, by, the, by the club. So when you're on your first couple of years, the RPA, they set guidelines for each club that you should be achieving 12 hours a month of non-rugby related um, activity. So that, I mean, that could be you're doing a barber course or you could be doing tree surgery, but for me, I always want to do something academic again. And I didn't mind it too much by the time I got to the end of my time at school. And um, yeah, so I definitely was keen to do academics again. And then they also have so many links with different websites, different courses, different you know, universities that it sort of is a perfect place to do it now. And I always, and my parents always say, well, if you're, if you're going to do it, do it now before you're 30 or whatever, and do it when you're, you know, you've got a lot more time than you would have. Have you got any any idea of you know what what the what are the goals for you now in terms of rugby and I've got that taste of like the England under twenty stuff which was awesomely awesome and everyone's dream is to play for for England and you know I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to ever play for England but just focusing on playing the best level I can play and enjoy it and uh, you know I enjoy taking that step up every time so when I played first team for Quinns it was obviously the biggest step up by far. And I just, I enjoyed it and I enjoyed testing myself. So I think, yeah, whatever that level is, just, you know, enjoy it and just be wanting to to get better and strive to be better, you know, whatever it may be, first team for Quinns or, or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. You said that, so I'm interested to find out actually, you know, what you know, what was the feeling or what does it feel like every time you get the, the nod from... England to say, oh yeah, we're kind of come along and what? Tell us a bit about the lead up to the games there and and how that works in camp with you know getting a whole load of under twenties together to uh, with a short amount of time to then to be able to perform. Yes, yeah, so I think you have so you have one camp before November, uh, before, yeah, in November, and I wasn't actually invited to that one. I never asked why. I didn't really know why and then we had a couple of A-League games in December and by the time the first official camp happened in January I was lucky enough to be in the squad so I think that's, that'll be the first week of January uh, and at that point it really is basic like boys coming from all different uh, clubs around the country completely different 
systems of attack, systems of defense, and especially lineouts. No one had, you know, everyone does different things. Uh, so each week, you say like the first one was building the foundations. The next one is, you know, you're building the walls or what have you. And you have these different sort of ways of saying it and making it. It's definitely stuck in my head that each camp we're coming in and we're learning something different so that come the week before France, which was our first game, we'll be like a complete side. We will know what we're doing. You know, we definitely won't be perfect, but you build it slowly. So there's probably four of those camps in Loughborough and down in uh, Reading in Bisham Abbey. And then the first week of France came. And I think we went down to London Scottish to train, which was my loan club this year. So I knew the boys there and I was quite looking forward to it, but we did scrums and we went back about 20 meters. Like it was embarrassing. And I remember us all looking around, just going, what's going on here? What we got ourselves into? And then we did malls and it was even worse. They must've scored 10. We didn't score one. So I think that was definitely a wake up call for us. What was the reason behind that? Was it uh, just based on size, all grown men? Or I think, just being that like te- technique. So the boys that were playing front row for us were actually the year below me. So they they barely played any men's rugby. So that was maybe a reason why. But also yeah, Scottish, they as I knew, they had a good pack anyway. But there was one of the boys in the front row for Scottish. He um he'd been in one of the first England camps and he didn't get called back. He was absolutely fuming. So he was he was definitely going all guns blazing. But um yeah, no, he, that was Definitely woke up cool. But then, you know, went out to Grenoble, which was the coolest rugby experience I ever had. There was 30,000 people in this stadium. They're all just an absolutely nuts, screwing their heads off. And um, yeah, luckily to get the win there. And then we just, the next week, went to Scotland and scraped the win. And I remember thinking, oh, this isn't good. But good night out after, luckily. And then the week after that, we went, uh, we had uh, Ireland at Northampton and they just ran away with it. And then that sort of set the tone for the next game, which was unlucky against Wales. They won by a point. So, and then obviously Corona virus caused the Italy game to be called off. So, you know, what started so well, you know, ended not quite as well, but you know, it's a whole experience to, you know, play and get your first cap and stuff like that. It definitely made it worthwhile. Yeah. What was the feeling like before your first game? I'd never played like these 16s, 17s, 18s. So this was my first time getting a cap. And um, it was just... It was just surreal for me because I'd always thought, you know, one day, you know, I'll go 18s, maybe hopefully 20s. And I finally got it. And you know, I was probably one of the only ones there that hadn't played the age group below. So that made it more special for myself. And then I was on the bench uh, and my best friend also from Quinns was starting in the second row. So I was just thinking how cool it'd be if we're both on at the same time. I'm with about 30, 35 to go. You know, I've got the nod and we were... We got on there and him being my best mate, we just gave each other a little look and we thought, this is actually happening now. You know, this is quite cool. You know, no one could take this away from us. But yeah, it was the most hostile crowd I've ever been in because you're doing your, your subs warm up along the side here and you've got <laughs> about 10,000 French fans calling every name under the sun just shouting at you. And then from my little French, I could pick out the swear words as well. It was good. <laughs> that sounds amazing. If you had to pick out one... Um, opportunity like one of like the best rugby moment ever what would you say that would be Grenoble comes close playing from 20s I'd say my first first team game at Quinns well my only first team game at Quinns I got it in October this year away at Saracens as well which was cool because Saracens growing up and like oh how good are they and you no know, it's they had like I hope Brad Barrett plays uh Ezekwe, Alex Good, like all these players that got like England caps. I was like, wow, this is this is real now. And that that was really cool. And the team we had out playing with your heroes as you grow up, like Rob Shaw, Mike Brown and stuff, that was yeah, that was that's probably the peak. And I had my family there and you no, know, it was that was really special, yeah. Oh, so you just mentioned there about some heroes. Who who was your like growing up, who was your your who were your heroes, I suppose, number one hero? So when I was very young, you obviously got Johnny Wilkinson. He's everyone's boyhood hero. Uh, and then as I got older, I remember going to watch Wasps uh, up at Adams Park and um, Joe Launchbury took time. Like he could have just gone back into his car and he took loads of time to speak to me. And that was just, that was really cool. So I'd say from then on in, I'd always had Joe Launchbury. You know, he was he was young at the time. He's probably 22, 23. And I always thought if I could emulate anything like him, you know, he, as a bloke, 
and then as a player as well, that'd be awesome. So yeah, he was definitely my second row idol. Uh, and then I also just loved Manny Tulangi when I was younger. I always used to think I'd be able to do what he does because I used to play centre. <laughs> And then there's a few genetic differences there. He's slightly more explosive than I am. So I definitely wouldn't be able to do that. But no, he's, yeah, he's always been definitely someone I idolise. Coming back to a bit more about the, um, you know, the, the fitness, but also I suppose through rugby, because being a professional rugby player is, is I suppose, quite gruelling and taxing on the body um, at the best of times. And especially, you know, in where you are at the moment, because you're, I suppose at the bottom trying to work your way up within professional rugby and you know you're getting beaten up in full contact training sessions I imagine with the first team and and then expected to play you know Monday nights um, in the A-League and and then been out on loan for other clubs as well what what are the things that Keel how do you stay motivated to to play professional rugby what's the thing that keeps you going I say like I, I always look at the the bigger picture of it all and think, you know, I'm slowly chipping away and one day, you know, I'll be the one that tells a 19 year old to go and do the defense for him. You know, like I think that would always be one thing, but then just to think how lucky I actually am, you know, this is a sport that I've loved since as I said before, six or maybe not six, seven or eight. And, um, I think, you know, I am doing a job where I'm running around, kicking the ball about, and having genuinely 90% of the day, you're always laughing or taking the mick out of someone or getting taken the mick out of. So I think I look at that and I think, you know, a lot of my friends are at uni now. They've got an essay due next week and they're not sleeping yeah. for two days because they're up doing up all nighters. So, uh, yeah, no, I look at that and I think, yeah, I'm pretty lucky playing with my best mates as well. So. And you mentioned there, I, I think it comes a part and parcel with rugby, doesn't it? Just ribbing people and getting ribbed back. And you've got to give as much as you get most of the time. Otherwise, you know, you get walked over quite, quite, quite <laughs> frankly, a lot yeah. of times in rugby. Um, but, you know, that fits in quite nicely with its you know, mental health awareness week this week. Um, and I think we, we as, as rugby players get a stigma of being you know, macho and um, being able to, to put up with, you know, more and people are taking the mickey out of each other the whole time. And But, you know, how important is, um, you know, being aware of mental health um, for you? Yeah, I think it's like coming in, as again, coming into that first team environment and professional environment, I had no idea that there'd be such an emphasis on mental well-being, mental health and stuff like that. And it's just absolutely crucial because in a sport where there's ups and downs, you know, everyone has ups and downs, but I feel like it's, you've got people outside public coming and get you in those ups and downs and stuff like that. It's just massively draining. I think there's definitely been that emphasis on speaking, you know, openly with each other and, you know, there's a time to take the mick out of someone. There's a time to, you know, console or look after them. So I think that was really important. And then they've just got great, like a great setup there. So you've got psychologists, you've got coaches that speak to you, you've got academy coaches that they have that, uh, they know what they're talking about. And they, they've also, a lot of them have been there before. So they can, you know, they can emphasize with us that the stuff going on and we'll get better and stuff like that. And then as you get older as well, you've got different stresses, you know, you may have financial stresses and stuff like that. And there's just so many systems from the RPA set out to make sure that, you know, there's there's something to fall back on and there's advice from everywhere. So I think, it, you know, it's definitely, definitely something that they've worked on, I suppose, in the last few years. Yeah, just for those people that don't know, um, you mentioned the RPA a couple of times, but what, what are they, um, for those who, who don't know, and for maybe for some of the younger listeners that, that might listen to this, and, and how do they help you as a professional rugby player? Yeah, so they're the Rugby Players Association. So they are essentially uh, a union, which is basically they have they are looking after our interests, uh, whether it be safety-wise, whether it be merchandise agreement-wise, whether it be your your salary, your contract signing, they are essentially a body of people that are, that are there to look after you if anything goes wrong, there could be legal help and stuff like that. So you you pay a small sub each year and then throughout the year you get all this massive help from them and it's definitely worthwhile because you know every day it seems at the moment they're sending out different readings just to keep our mind stimulated and stuff like that. So yeah, they are essentially a massive help to us all each club's got a rep that you know is always in and around the club so you can talk to them about your next stage of life or what you want to do after so yeah no they're, they're a massive help 
all. And in terms of like what the, the club do, is it in, for mental well, uh, well-being and mental health, is it a systematic thing that they put in? or um, So is it like a weekly, monthly occurrence that you go through these uh, workshops or discussions with people? How does it work? So actually at the moment during lockdown, um, we are filling out a form that uh, we're explaining, you know, how we're feeling. It's just a quick five questions explaining how we're feeling. And that's every Monday. So they can be flagged up by the psychologist very easily. And then he, you know, he goes and asks, you know, he goes and checks them out. So it's called the health and wellbeing questionnaire. Um, and the questions are feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge. Um, not able to stop or control worrying. Uh, you have little interest or pleasure in doing things and feeling down, depressed or hopeless, the four questions. But I, speaking to the psychologists, um, I said that there's only one that I would answer for one, luckily, uh, with any score, and that'd be the little interest in doing anything. Because at the moment, I'd have to stay in bed till 12, as I said earlier. So, yeah, that's been a work on for me. And he's just been trying to stimulate my brain a bit more, so... And, and who out of the players is is the best person? Who's like the sort of agony aunt uh, that people go to if you're down or they notice when you're down and they come over and sit with you and stick an arm around you? Who are those people within camp? I say there's, um, especially for a younger boys, a guy called Niall Saunders, like whether it's taking the mick out of you or whatever, he can always you know put a smile on your face. He's quite a funny bloke. He does stupid things. So he's definitely one I go to. And then... Yeah, I lived, I lived as I said, six boys last year. So any of those boys, I know the now has picked me up. And then for the senior lads, I think you just gonna need to spend a bit of time with Joe Marlow. He'll make you laugh. Like he's, as you see on the videos, the interviews he does, you know, he's quite funny. So yeah, I think just being around the company of you know people that are gonna make you laugh and stuff like that. And then on the flip side, who do you stay away from? Otherwise, they're gonna put you in a in a bad mood. Is there anyone? Is there anyone there like that, or you just stay out of their way? <laughs> yeah, it's probably one of the best mates Harry Barlow he's just a grumpy a grumpy boy so if you're ever in a bad mood you don't want to be in a worse mood so you stay away from him but no I think most lads realise they, they can't sap around the training ground otherwise you get known as a sapper so yeah, <laughs> they're always yeah. trying to do it at their own homes but yeah Okay, cool. No, that's, I think that's a great insight, especially around the questions and for, you know, some parents out there that it might give them some ideas to, you know, ask questions or, or especially when you're at home. Because I, I imagine I've been so surprised hearing the, the amounts of rates, even with, you know, I think it's just children as young as sort of like eight, nine, ten that are, you know, getting under stress and, and under different uh, things recently. So it's, it's it's really important, I think, for everybody, um, parents, um, all players out there to, to, you know, talk about your feelings and tell people how you feel. And, and like you say, go to the people that, you know, and put an arm around you or, or be the person. And I think one of the campaigns at the moment is be, be the mate you'd want to be. If, based on what you know now, um, a good question. So if you were a, like a 12, 13 year old rugby player based on what you know what, know now, what would be, you know, the one piece of advice you would tell yourself or go back and tell you? I think be patient would be the first thing I'd say. Like you can't force, if you wanted to, you know, if you want to end up in rugby, you can't force it. You know, you're not, most of the time you're not ready until you get picked. So I think that was definitely when I was younger, I was always annoyed that I was never in the Quins under 13s, 14s, 15s. But realistically, it you know hasn't come back to bite me at all. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So I'd say be patient, especially in a sport like rugby. People develop at so many different rates. There's so many ways into rugby. You know, that, that under 15 academy game against Worcester is not the be all and end all. So I'd say that. And then, you know, don't don't rush it in the sense that you've got players like Alex Dombrandt, you know, probably one of the best players in the league at the moment. He didn't play academy rugby. He just joined Quinns after uni. So I'd say, yeah, just relax, don't panic and just be patient in your in your rugby journey. Yeah. That's great advice, mate. Um, I, one of the questions I forgot to ask earlier, actually, is um, it was around that uh, getting into, I suppose, the Quinns at 16, 17. How, how many of those lads um, that you played with at um, your age group, 16 to 18, are now playing um, professional rugby? So there were, there's now four of us still, yeah, four of us still playing as of next year. So they, so they always said when they were in the under-13s, there was about 150. 
So when I got there, there's probably, there's probably about 40. So, um, yeah, no, there's, there's four of us as of next year. So, yeah, it really has, you yeah, know, lost a few mates along the way. Yeah, I think that goes, that just backs up what you said. And if you, if you do, if you do find yourself not making the, um, academy squad for whatever reason, um, the, the, stay patient like you mentioned and and one of the key things that the last two guys so Henry and uh, James said when they came on is you know keeping keep playing the game because you love it because if you don't keep playing the game because you love it you're going to be playing it for the wrong reasons and and uh, you yeah, end up falling out of love with it and I unfortunately you know too many stories where players have not been patient fallen out of love with the game and now aren't playing rugby at all, which is really sad considering, you know, we all start playing rugby because we're playing with our mates. And it was really, really interesting to hear that you saying that you're so um, fortunate and lucky that you basically get to go to work and play rugby with your mates. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, just looking at that, like I've got one of my best mates for, throughout school, probably one of the best players I ever played with. Didn't quite happen for him and he never played rugby again. Like something as simple as that. And I, I wish that he'd gone to go and play for Guildford. You know, they're the men's team there and he would have just refound his love and maybe could have done it again because he had all the skills. He had the, the right physical you know, abilities. He just, he wasn't quite patient enough to, to wait for it to happen. So yeah, definitely examples like that. And you hear those and you're like, you know, obviously it's easy for me to say everything has luckily fallen into place, but you just wish people were giving it another chance just to see what would have happened. Yeah, but the thing is, you say luckily falling into place. I, I'm a big believer of, you know, you make your own luck, and I think if you if you stay patient, you work hard, and you, you continue to to develop the, the things that you want to develop, you're always going to be able to play at the highest level you can play. And you know, I think you've 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 shown that to you know the the effort and, and everything you've put in has resulted in you being where you are now, mate. So uh, you know massive congratulations and I I hope you're able to to continue to to grow uh, through Quinns and, and get a lot of um, uh, a lot more caps under the belt uh, and hopefully represent um, England at some stage too yes thank you very much yeah that's a, a big dream isn't it but yeah we'll see how it goes thank you no worries um, before we go though just got a few questions uh, the first one comes in from Big Ferg over at Roslyn Park, <laughs> he just says, uh, um, oh, "I just wanted to know how you enjoyed your time at Roslyn Park." Uh, he said, "You're a great guy, and the boys miss you." Yeah, no, it was definitely my first experience into being part of a like the squad that played in men's rugby. So I was at Quinns, and I was always part of the academy group, or what have you. But this, you know, I was playing. I think I played for 15 weeks straight at one point at Roslyn Park. So, um, yeah, that was just an awesome experience. Like you go on these massive coach journeys and then that slightly, you know, there was people afterwards having beers and the coach and stuff like that. The socials are also like awesome. And then the lads there were just so welcoming. Like, I was the only one on loan there, I think. And obviously being 18, I was probably a bit apprehensive, but they were, yeah, I felt within weeks, I felt like part of the squad, whether they were taking the mick out of me or not, I was happy to just be involved in the conversation. So yeah, no, I loved being at Austin Park. It was a great man. Also, the 4G made a big difference because that was nice. It was never too muddy. So, <laughs> uh, I think we touched on it already, but it just it's from my owner. She said, what age did you start playing rugby and um, how did you get into it? Yeah, so just, I remember watching rugby before that with my dad and always being unsure about it and wanting to play football. But yeah, just my sister actually played rugby first. So in one of the sessions, midway through the season, I my dad just dropped me off with the other age group. And yeah, I was probably about six and that's how it happened. But yeah, it was it was always a great little club down there. And yeah, so I'd say that that was my first rugby memory, my sister playing and me just getting chucked into it. But I don't think I had a choice of my dad because I was always going to end up playing rugby. So... <laughs> That's quality. Uh, and the last one here is um, on the uh, the mental health awareness stuff. And I mentioned earlier, but I don't think we asked the question. But, you know, how do you think the uh, the macho stereotype of a of a male rugby player um, affects on mental health and potentially not being able to open up to other players? Yeah, I think that you know you're right there. The persona of players is that they're just macho. They 
they hide their emotions they're that typical you know stereotypical male they don't want to talk about it they don't want to let the feelings go but I think that it's just I don't think that is the case anymore I think that stigma needs to change through players in rugby, through players in football, through players in cricket, speaking out on mental health issues, because that will mean, you know, the average, you know, they're role models. So the average male is then looking at these superheroes, these superstars, speaking you know, from the heart about their, their emotions. And it, it would just become the norm. Whereas I think at the moment there is, you know, there's still that slight gap between there are, probably a lot going on in people's lives. They don't want to talk about it all, but that, that openness would just change it for the whole of, you know, society and the mental health. That if you've got these these gods, these heroes, you know, Wayne Rooney, if he had started talking about it five years ago, you know, it would have been everywhere. So stuff like that, that just small changes would just make a massive difference, I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's funny you mentioned Wayne Rooney there because I thought you were a Liverpool fan. Yeah, <laughs> I have. Yeah, I don't know. I was going to go Steven Gerrard, but he was first. Go ahead. I think I watched a documentary yesterday on Man United, for some reason, despite being a massive Liverpool fan. But. Okay, right. No worries. Okay, Stu, thanks so much for your time, mate. Um, great to catch up. And as I mentioned already, you know, all of us here at Lions wish you the best in your um, professional rugby career. And hopefully, you know, if this podcast is still going strong in, in a year, a couple of years, it'd be good to, to catch up again and, and see how you've you've been getting on. Yeah, thanks very much for the time. Cheers. Cheers thanks, thank mate. Um, okay, guys, uh, next week, we've got Tom Bowen from England Sevens coming along to join us. So if you've got any questions for him, make sure you uh, send us through. You can send them through to andy at Sports. Dot Academy um, and we'll ask you all the questions but make sure you tune in there and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. 